Wellesley Weston Lifetime Learning offers non-credit courses to seniors in the greater Boston area. For more information about WWLL and links to our videos, please go to www.llcourses.org. Joe Ferguson back as a speaker. Uh, he appeared once in 2013 and gave an interesting talk. So I'll give a short bio, well, a bio. Uh, Joe was born in 1930 and grew up in Bergenfield, New Jersey. That's in Bergen County, where I happen to grow up too. Um, it, it was suburban. Uh, and, and it was post-depression era, so that uh, I guess all of the neighborhood was a little run down, as lots of them uh, so as places were. Uh, Joe, Joe's father commuted to New York for an insurance company, and later uh, decided to give that up, and he bought a little farm in upstate New York. And uh, that's where Joe was, was spent his high school years uh, doing all the farm chores, like milking the cow and, and, and everything else, before going to school, which was a rugged life. Uh, after graduating from high school, he decided, well, that wasn't for him, so he hitchhiked to New York City and uh, found a job with the old, that was the New York Central Railroad where he worked as a laborer. He was able to find a uh, job there, and then, uh, but at night he was able to uh, attend Cooper Union uh, to follow his interest in art. Uh, meanwhile, the Korean War came along, and in 1952, uh, Joe was granted into the Army. Uh, he served two years, nine, of, uh, nine months of which were in Korea, uh, building uh, airfields. Uh, for R&R, &R, uh, the GIs would go to, would, would go to uh, Japan, which was uh, fairly well built up at that time. But the R&R, uh, the R &R rest, uh, rest and recuperation, was uh, great for the GIs, they loved it. Uh, there, Joe was able to study some of the Asian art. Uh, after discharge, uh, Joe was able to uh, follow his uh, interest in art and receive the uh, uh, scholarship under the GI Bill and attended uh, the Edinburgh College of Art. Now, uh, so he was able to get his four years there, uh, thanks to the GI Bill. Uh, he had a little trouble getting the bill, but I mean the money to uh, get all his expenses, but everything worked out well. And following graduation, he had received a three months traveling a Carnegie's Traveling Scholarship, where he was able to visit all of the famous places in Europe, which was very helpful to his uh, art education. Uh, meanwhile, he acquired a wife, and the two of them had a great time together. Uh, uh, Joe uh, uh, followed his interest in, uh, yeah, well, he had many interests, but uh, Stained glass. Uh, he did stained glass in Boston. He settled in the Boston area because of the uh, ability for uh, way to uh, further study in art. He bought a little farm in uh, uh, Weston and uh, that included a farmhouse. And fortunately, uh, Joe was uh, very good with his hands and was able to rebuild this barn, this barn into a beautiful, beautiful studio 
And he also has a big workshop uh, that from plug glass, uh, stained glass. And he also uh, liked restoring uh, antique automobiles. Now he has a uh, Lagun which he showed pictures of. Now he has a an older packet, so yeah, it, you might see him in an auto show driving by. Uh, I, found, I found that he was, uh, he spent the summer, summers at Monhegan Island, which he'll talk about. Uh, fortunately, we were, we were able to visit there, and it's a quaint little place off the coast of Maine, very isolated, no electricity, and uh, uh, they do lobster fishing. But uh, uh, interesting enough, they do the lobster fishing uh, in the winter, where they say the uh, lobster tastes better. But uh, anyhow, we have uh, Joe to speak to us about the place, about the arts. Uh, he, he, as you say, many talents, auto restoring, uh, art glass, sculpture, uh, uh, woodworking, and of course these antique cards. So uh, I would like to welcome Joe Ferguson. My name is Pam Fox. I'm here today with Joe Ferguson, uh, a sculptor from Weston, and we're delighted that we can produce a program about his work in the library, which everyone enjoys so much, and at his home on Conant Road, where he has some large, uh, beautiful sculptors, sculptures in the landscape. I'd also like to mention his book, The Evolving Image, which has uh, wonderful color photos of his work and also um, the uh, biographical information, information about the philosophy behind the, the, the sculptures and so forth, and that is available uh, from Amazon and on his website. I'm Joe Ferguson. Uh, this is my studio in Weston. I've been doing sculpture for 60 years or so, and um, if you'll follow me, we'll go inside. This is a model of Zeus we're going to look at later on. Uh, it's done just in uh, sheet metal soldered together and painted. Uh, the final product is in aluminum. This is Star Plow down there um, in the yard. Again, this is just uh, soldered together. So it can be uh, from the small model. It's uh, one, one inch to the foot scale. So I can take the patterns directly off the uh, model and just make it larger and weld, weld, the, weld the seams together. These are some free forms that I did of uh, pyramids, some experiments with using brass, uh, polished brass, chunks of glass in it. This is a possible mo uh, scale model for a larger piece where you would have a mirror in the middle to reflect all of the uh, colored colors from the glass around it. This is one of the early experiments I did with wood and sort of based on Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth in England. I was very interested, interested in the English sculptors at the time. Um, these are some other models. Now we'll go over to this side. This is a model, scale model, of uh, the chromocopter sculpture. 
and this is one inch to the foot square uh, model. Uh, I made several of these models before I started the main sculpture. And it has pieces that can come out of it and so that it can be worked on. Uh, the end sculpture does change a little, but generally it's about the same. It is the same scale. The first sculpture I did, uh, the uh, yellow submarine, I thought I should do that um, without making a model. I thought I should work directly and then it, uh, spontaneously. The problem with that was that if I had to change anything, uh, it meant a week or so of taking it apart and rebuilding it and not quit knowing what to do. So then I went to making uh, scale models of all the work that I do after that. It's not as spontaneous, but uh, it truly is the only way to do anything on a very large scale. Um, I've always been interested in architecture. Probably uh, I would have gone into architecture if I'd had a better uh, background in mathematics, which I didn't have. Um, I went to see uh, to uh, Turkey some years back and uh, saw lots of uh, solar panels on the root, beautiful roofs there and they were all bleeding rust and looking ugly so I came back and I thought maybe I should design a solar panel that was part of the architecture and this is the result that would be the solar panel in back uh, this would be the uh, main bedroom and the balcony and then an inner court and then uh, some uh, roofing that would reflect the light back up onto the solar panels. This would be the result. I also wanted to uh, make a, a sculpture that wasn't architectural, but didn't serve the purpose to be lived in, was something where people could go in and just meditate or, and this is the scale generally of this, it would be roughly 30 feet the bottom also made to come apart so there's the inner chamber that people would go inside so the children couldn't climb on the truss work and they could just sit down there and listen to music at night there would be lights that would light it up and it would look like kind of a large gem in the darkness the symbolism is uh, really great for a modern society where in the past the pyramid was a secret place for a single or a single or a family a royal family uh, now we're democratic society with its transparent and uh, so everyone takes part in in that in a sense it's a ritual I suppose to go and sit down and uh, meditate I finished my studies in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, in art. Uh, Isabel and I married uh, in Surrey in England, and um, I had a scholarship for three months study in um, Europe. So that was our honeymoon. We went off to England. We went to the south of England uh, to the cathedrals and um, on to France and uh, down through Italy and um, then up uh, through Germany and back. After that, we uh, uh, decided we wanted to live in Boston. Uh, we came to Boston in um, 1957, and I worked for a, a company, a stained glass company, who were doing uh, windows in uh, Haymarket Square in Boston called Reynolds, Francis, and Roanstock. They were an old company, and uh, Reynolds was the last of, member of the uh, company. And they were still doing um, revival uh, stained glass. And at the time, I did this small panel, just using uh, fragments of glass there. My idea at the time was to uh, try and um, come up with a new st sort of uh, symbolism that was more relevant to uh, the modern stained glass idiom. And um, so I used all sorts of um, symbols from, visual symbols from other religions and put it all together. Eventually, 
though I realize that um, uh, people uh, are literate, and so you don't really need picture symbols to uh, tell a story. But I was left with uh, the beauty of stained glass and uh, how to uh, how to use it in in a more modern setting. And um, this is one example of what some of the early work that I did do. I wanted to make it three dimensional, and I wanted to use very large pieces of of glass because the glass is hand blown, and uh, in itself, it's beautiful. I mean, you don't really want to cut it up into little pieces. So, um, how to do that was my problem. And um, in this case, I made a wooden frame and then used brass wire, brass rod, and made a um, kind of a armature to set the glass in. And then I bound the uh, pieces of glass with copper foil and in this case some using large chunks of glass uh, for the texture and uh, even blown forms that I got down in West Virginia um, and in that way I was able to build compositions uh, that were more modern and that allowed light to come into the room because I didn't want to have a dark cathedral setting. Most of the modern work uh, done at that time was uh, light and airy, and so I wanted to preserve that and use the glass in that way. Okay, I was always looking for different ways to set the stained glass uh, in uh, different mediums, and this is um, this was a chance to do it with this commission over in Old Cambridge Baptist Church in. Uh, Cambridge, 1962, and this glass is set in concrete. Uh, it was a memorial window for uh, Dean Samuel Miller, who'd been a minister in the church there. The idea here is that this is the tree of life, the symbolism, and the tree itself is the dark part reaching out. And there are three symbols of God and the top of it, the sun, the measuring the universe, and the seven stars of creation, fire. Then at the bottom there are thorns and things like that that suggest real life. Another technique I used at the time and experimented with using um, setting the glass into an iron armature. Um, and this was done out in church in Lenox, Mass, in. Uh, the mid 60s and in this uh, I build an armature of bar stock and then put angle iron frame had angle iron frameworks made for the various people that diminished as they went higher um, and then the glass was set into these into all of these uh, angle iron frameworks there were 26 windows in the chapel um, and they were um, about 18, 20, 24 feet high, 8 feet at the base, and about 2 feet deep. So it was an awful lot of welding. I had to learn how to weld to do this, and uh, it was a lot of welding, and uh, had to work with union people, and uh, it was really quite a job. But um, unfortunately, the chapel has been destroyed since then. So things go on, things evolve. With all of the, what I learned about welding from the um, different projects, um, I had a lot of iron stock left over, and um, I returned to the original idea I had was really to bring stained glass out into the landscape and a sculpture. So one of the first uh, attempts to do that was the yellow submarine. And the idea I wanted was to have something that children could climb up into and a sphere that they could put their head inside of and look out from. Hey, this is the Yellow Submarine uh, done back in the 60s when the, uh, the Beatles film was uh, popular. I needed a name for this object and uh, Yellow Submarine seemed, uh, seemed the right name, I think, because 
because I'd painted it yellow. But uh, more than that, uh, it's a fantasy machine. You can climb inside it and put your head up into the globe and everything looks very psychedelic. Uh, and not only that, but you have the squeaky takeoff from the propeller there. Again, it's just uh, putting uh, colored glass into the landscape and finding ways to make uh, the optimum color uh, reflected, reflected uh, surfaces uh, and seeing the color because uh, nature tends to eat away uh, objects. Trees are more important and, and uh, so sculpture is in competition with nature in a sense. So you really have to be pretty dramatic to call attention to it. I haven't been here for a while. <laughs> Isabel and I came to Boston in 1957. We spent a little time down in Hemingway Street in a little apartment where the bed came out of the wall, so we had to make the bed up every day and stick it back into the wall. I needed a place to work, and gradually we found a place in uh, Wellesley, a large old house that needed repair, and uh, I was very handy at repairing things, so we bought that, and um, I did started doing some commission work, and uh, I worked uh, for Reynolds uh, Stained Glass for a while, and started my own business. But I needed more space, and so finally we found a place in uh, Weston, an old beat-up barn that nobody seemed to want at the time. Part of it was uh, re redone, um, and it was rented out to some bachelors that left beer cans all over the place, and uh, it was it really needed a lot of work, and so we bought that and. Um, in the next, over the next 50 years, we had um, three chill, three boys, and in the process, we rebuilt the barn, part, and half of it was my studio. During that period, I did commissions for churches and for private houses, and, um, and then gradually got more and more in, into uh, sculpture in the landscape. This piece, um, Solar Flare, uh, was in my studio when my wife died. And um, some friends in the town um, helped, uh, helped to uh, buy it and uh, have it placed here in the library as a, in memory of Isabel. And I'm really, truly grateful to the people in the town for doing that. This is uh, three periods of uh, work that I've done. The far one is a guardian. Uh, the idea is that it's a, an enclosed spacecraft of some sort that's come to observe uh, our planet. Uh, it's made out of uh, core tin. At the time, my welding was uh, just beginning and uh, core tin was a popular medium at the time for sculptors to explore. It's supposed to rust and stop rusting, but unfortunately it does keep rusting. Um, the other sculpture is the next stage in my learning how to weld, and that's in aluminum. It's called Samorian. The idea is that it looks a little like a spaceship, an ion driven spaceship, but it also looks like a turtle and a scorpion. So uh, you can, or a Japanese uh, samurai soldier, so you can take from that whatever you want. Uh, the upgrade in my welding technique was in aluminum, which again is a wonderful material for outdoors. It lasts forever, and at night in the moonlight it glows. This is a chromocopter. It's uh, stainless steel, acrylic plastic, and some glass. And this is a more mature version of the yellow submarine. It's, being in stainless steel, I don't have to paint it, which is a major problem when you have sculpture outdoors. You have to maintain it. 
and uh, steel tends to need to be painted every once in a while. The stainless steel is glittery. It, it uh, uh, doesn't need maintenance. Uh, the acrylic plastic in it uh, is reflected by the uh, uh, silvery surface of the stainless steel. Children can climb up inside it. The whole idea is that they can become part of the landscape sculpture. And often I've seen kids go in, and even quite large kids go in there, and they get a dreamy look on their face as they go off into space, because you're looking out from that through the colors of the kind of a kaleidoscope effect of it. Okay, I'm using Manbiguity and Viridiana here, two sculptures, to exhibit uh, how art takes place sometimes in such unexpected ways. Originally, I wanted the man figure, and I built that. And then, after I'd done that, I wanted a female figure, so I made this coiffure of brass rod and put a face in it. But I didn't like the face, and I wasn't very happy with the man figure. So what I did was to take the face out of the coiffure there and put it in back of the man's figure. And this determined the name of it, calling it Manbiguity. It seemed very appropriate. So it has the male figure and the female combined. But then I was left with a coiffure of brass rod there with no face in it. So being Scottish and wanting to make the most of materials, I started working on a face for Viridiana. And gradually, it seems as if I like the color green in both of these pieces. And this is what came about. So she, I was still able to maintain some of the coiffure of her, the original character. Then I just added some flowers to it and gave her an inner eye and gave her a little bit of rhythms in the, her hairdo. She's sort of sulking a little bit, but uh, I wanted her to have some sort of personality. This is called Ibis. Uh, it's uh, really taking uh, Alexander Calder's idea of moving sculpture um, in the wind. And um, Ibis uh, should turn in the wind. We don't have any wind right now, but um, this is sort of what it does. The idea is that it uh, is constantly changing um, the colors and uh, Instead of glass here, I, originally I had glass, stained glass in it, but then uh, I couldn't uh, show it anywhere because people were afraid of the uh, liability. So I went to uh, acrylic, and this is uh, what they call a dichroic acrylic. It has a lamination so that the colors in it, it's all, it's all the same uh, acrylic, but uh, depending on where you're looking at it from, it can be a magenta or a blue or a gold or a yellow. Uh, and that's what happens as it turns around. Okay, a good deal of my work is uh, exhibited here in the Western Library. I'm grateful for that. It's been some of it. It's been here for five years now. This piece is uh, one of a series of round ones that I did of fragments of glass. Originally, I'd done a commission for a church, and uh, it used this plan, but um, it was so attractive that I kept on with that. Uh, the imagery in uh, sun and water is fairly obvious. It's just like a sunset or something. The circle is a very pleasing way to arrange a composition, and uh, so I've made a series of these circles. It also gives me a little bit of uh, dimensionality plus the um, solid forms of the chunks of glass, the textures and all of the different angles that I can put the, the glass at. 
Uh, as far as symbolism goes, underneath the, the water, I have shapes that are like ancient ships that have been sunk in the water. And uh, to me, that's probably the most interesting part of the composition. Although I've tried hard to give a kind of a um, radiance, I suppose, when the light hits these different objects and so that it's always changing. Back in the 80s, um, I'd done a lot of commissions for churches and uh, New York World Fair and other things using stained glass. And um, stained glass um, is a beautiful medium, but um, I felt that I wanted to do something uh, that was pure form and not relying on the color of the stained glass. And so um, my uh, welding techniques by that time had gotten pretty good. And uh, I started making little models of uh, sculpture that was entirely form and uh, bending flat metal into different shapes. <clears throat> and all of these aluminum sculptures, I seem to have spent uh, about 10 years of my life making these uh, large sculptures for outdoors. Um, and this one is to give give you some sense of being embraced by a god. Um, it's impressive just to be in that sense of embrace. And there's also something sinister about it because this is possibly a sacrificial altar or something. It has some, some sort of a, possibly a religious or some theme about it like that. Uh, the aluminum sculptures the beauty of gun is uh, making something that can last out in the uh, in the um, landscape and uh, doesn't need to be uh, uh, taken care of too much. Okay, this sculpture sculpture is another aluminum sculpture. Uh, it's called Narwhal, uh, and it's based on a conch shell that's been eroded by the sand when you walk along the ocean you'll find shells and the sand has eroded parts of the uh, outer part of the shell so you see the convolutions of how the shell grew and uh, to me that was very interesting because it's so sculptural uh, and emphasizes uh, the sculpture the sculptural quality uh, uh, so that as every view of it is different I suppose that's one of the things that's always been appealing to me you know, with sculpture is that it uh, is always different, no matter, it's, it's always changing uh, as you move around it. With a painting, in a sense a painting to me is, uh, and it's an accomplishment, uh, but uh, it is flat and um, it is in a sense one dimensional if you look at it and the, uh, the uh, three dimensionality is, is, is an, an illusion where with sculpture, there's a physical reaction to the uh, moving around of it and the changes that take place. So to me, that's much more interesting. It's more, it's not just 360 degrees, but it's uh, the bottom and the top you look at or you're conscious of. And you can relax and lean into it and become part of it. This is a smaller studio that I keep heated in the winter time. Um, Saturday mornings I have some retired friends that come and work in here and they uh, they do sculpture and stained glass but uh, most of the time most of the week I'm pretty busy in here just doing my own thing this is a piece I'm working on right now and uh, this uh, is going to be the idea is that it's the wind um, and uh, and I haven't made any plans for this, any drawings or anything. I'm really trying to let it tell me what to do. And it changes dramatically. Um, lips, I've tried different lips and of course, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, but the idea is really to, to put glass in a position where it can be seen and colorful more than um, 
depicting a figure, the most important part of it is to get uh, a structure that holds the glass and that is really uh, shows the glass and the color and form off to advantage. Okay, I melt the solder off, take, take the solder. Then I place it on, onto it. Cover the copper foil with the solder. You notice I'm careful not to drop the solder on my hand because it's still hot. Pick it up. Say I want to do that. I use the solder flux. The flux cleans the metal. Whenever you solder or weld or anything like that, you have to deal with the oxygen in the atmosphere that wants to keep it from soldering. Now, if I don't like it, if I look at it and find that it's really not the right thing, I can just go back. It's tedious work, but uh, I haven't found a better way of doing it. It's a lot of fun doing this kind of work because uh, I never know where it's going to go. All I do know is that I want it to have a rhythm, a swirling rhythm. And so whatever I do, I try to accent that rhythm by repetition of things getting smaller, diminishing, and uh, the actual linear structure of the thing. The fact that it turns into a face here is sort of incidental, but people like that. People can like to, to, to uh, hang on to what is a physical appearance. With sculpture, you always have to be thinking in terms of 360 degrees around the sculpture. So it has to look good from every angle. That's a challenge that painters don't have but it's a, a challenge I enjoy very much. I wanted to get into why people do what they do, because it's not just artists that do these things, that use art. It's everybody uses art in one form or another, whether you're a surgeon, a tennis player, um, an engineer, an architect, uh, a housewife, we all use art in one form or another. And to get into this, I'm going to take you to Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine. Has anybody been there before? Great. So you know a little bit what it's like. Monhegan um, is a special island. A lot of, isla a lot of uh, artists go there. Uh, it's about nine miles off the coast. Um, in Penobscot Bay. It's small. You can walk around it in one day if you're really fit. If you really, uh, because some of it is very uh, cliff, uh, cliffs and mountains and things like that. It's, but it's worth doing. Um, there's a lighthouse. Um, there's a, a library, a wonderful library, um, a little one-room schoolhouse. About 40 people live there during uh, the year, and it fills up with tourists in the summertime. There's also a church, and in the evening, we go to a, a song service in the church. And we sing old hymns that I haven't heard since I was a little boy. The old rugged cross and um, onward Christian soldiers and um, uh, let the lower lights be burning, send a beam across the waves. Some poor sailor may be sinking in the, and you may save. And then we end up with um, now the day is dawning. Night is drawing nigh. Shadows of the evening steal across the sky. And we file out of the church 
quietly after all the singing. And there's usually a woman outside with a flashlight to guide us down the stairs because outside it's pitch black because on, on an island the darkness is just uh, like, like falling into the water. It surrounds you, it almost touches you. And you look up and overhead is the Milky Way and it spans the sky from one horizon to another. And there's so many stars in the Milky Way that it glows and it's a glowing force and it's really lovely. We know that the Milky Way is part of the Earth's galaxy. galaxy that there are many galaxies like it, so many that uh, they're uncountable. Some are larger than ours, some are smaller. When our Earth was formed, it was a molten mass. There are examples of uh, the cooling of the Earth's surface on Monhegan Island. There's a little, a, a large rock about the size of four or five houses on the coast. And it looks as if it's just been bubbled out of the surface of a molten a mass of rock. It's smooth. The earth is still hot underneath. The core of the earth is still molten. We see ex examples of that in volcanoes and and the fact that the surface of the earth is moving with tectonic plates. The earth cooled off and oceans formed and they were warm. And it's believed that a chemical reaction produced the first forms of life on earth in single cell cells that had the ability to divide and reproduce. Uh, they also had within them the ability to change and transform. And out of these abilities to reproduce and to change, all of the creatures of the ocean were formed from seaweed and barnacles and crabs and all the enormous variety of uh, sea creatures to whales from the very smallest to the very largest. And this was the first life on Earth. With time uh, and through storms, great storms, some of these creatures were thrown onto the dry land. Some landed into swamps and some landed in the mud and in tidal flats. Some burrowed in, into the mud. Some were left behind in tidal pools. If you've ever looked, looked into a tidal pool, you can see how much life is in there. With time, these sea creatures, uh, some of these sea creatures uh, lived, most of them just died. But the ones that lived were able to adapt to breathing oxygen, uh, to, a, to an atmosphere that had just been formed on the earth. And the earth, instead of being just a molten crust, had suddenly changed into a green salad for these creatures. Um, there were lichens and grasses and flowers and uh, all manner of vegetation. Just one, if you just look at one example of mosses or, or flowers, they go on forever, you know, there's so many different varieties. The sea creatures moved away from the oceans and they changed. They adapted to
to different continents, some in China and all over Asia, some in Africa, some in the Middle East. And they, uh, animals, all sorts of animals suddenly appeared from dinosaurs to worms that uh, crawled in the ground. Uh, just a tremendous variety of animals every and different sizes all over the globe, all over the earth. And they all had to um, change in order with what food was available to them, what the uh, temperatures were, and all of these things had an effect on what they were, what they became. What, and gradually, we had some s creatures that were standing up, as we do, and they were our ancestors. We wouldn't recognize them, probably, or we wouldn't want to recognize them. They were small creatures, and they were very vulnerable because uh, the beasts they had to contend with were pretty ferocious. They lived in caves, in natural caves. And um, they had one advantage over the other animals. They discovered the use of fire. And with fire, they could keep warm. They could keep the other animals out of the caves. And they could cook meals for a change. They could cook meat, which was a lot more tasty than raw meat. And some of the cave people started to scrawl on the walls of the cave with the uh, embers from the fire and their scrawlings became images of animals outside the cave. And there was a mystery to this, a sudden mystery, because the animals they scrawl on the wall were harmless. And these uh, pictures, the first images made by man, uh, became part of the religious um, feelings of these people. They increased in number and devised ways of um, taking on the big animals. And um, they became what they're called the hunter-gatherer people. They lived outside the caves, for, formed small communities. Uh, and they started to form all over the uh, world. Tribal groups began to form. And they set a pattern, the tribal pattern, for the way we govern today. In the tribe, in the early tribes, there were three groups that shared power, because tri the tribe had the power to do things that ordinary people, uh, single people, couldn't do. And the three powers were the governmental power, the chief, which we now call the president, had been a king or something like that. There was the military part of the tribe, the second part. They defended the tribe from other tribes, or they were aggressors and went out and uh, did mean things to other people. And there was a religious part of the tribe, the religious uh, didn't seem to have much power in the beginning because they kept the records of the tribe. Um, and they, set, uh, they told people um, what, it, what, what, the, uh, what life was about, uh, why the moon appeared and why the sun appeared and why they were important and how to... Um, govern one another's lives in a harmonious way. Um, the records they kept of the tribe were important, and they went back to the very origin of the tribe, but they were oral because there was no writing in the beginning. And these oral traditions were kept through memory. The number of people increased, and the villages, they set up villages and um, began building houses and um, 
They were the basis of the beginning of real communities. And around um, early, in, early on, um, writing, the ability to write, became an ob obsession with people that went on for several hundred years. And the oral histories were turned into writing and became the uh, volumes that were um, that have become that have come down to us as the literature that we use in our major religions around the world. And there were many of these um, books that came down. In India, there was the Bhagavad Gita, and uh, in the Hebrew culture, where there was Torah. Later on. At, uh, uh, Jesus was uh, born and crucified. Uh, that's one of the reasons why this church is here. A hundred years after he was crucified, the Gospels were written. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were added to the Torah, to the Hebrew tradition, because Jesus was Jewish. And that became our Christian Bible. The Koran of the Muslim world that everybody's so concerned about now was much later, uh, written by Muhammad, and that was the beginning of another faith. All of these books and, uh, that have come down to us have served uh, a pre-scientific world uh, and given comfort to people in the most uh, difficult of times. So the books that came down to us were, some were the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, and um, these are traditions that um, have served us before science came to us. The civilizations were growing, um, and churches, large church, uh, churches and um, synagogues and um, uh, architectural places were established. And in Europe, uh, great cathedrals were raised, and all of the artists were uh, put to work doing sculpture and stained glass and mosaics, and, uh, and even musicians were taken in, and the art started to become part of tribal culture for the first time, and they were sponsored by the religious orders. With time, um, the um, artists um, became part of the tribal order. They had a certain amount of they shared the power of the tribal unit. And um, in Italy, in the 14th century, uh, the beginning of the uh, Western art uh, occurred. And we had artists like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and they served the church, but they were starting to uh, look at um, uh, the order of human beings in a, in a, in a, a different way. Um, and it's called a period of humanism. And the um, technology had, had started to come in and there was the invention of movable type in the printing press and uh, copper plate engraving, so that books and information could be more widely spread, and images uh, were produced. And one of the main uh, people of, of that uh, imagery was Albrecht Durer. His copper plate engravings are, are revered now. Technology kept increasing at the time and uh, it was taking drawing power away from uh, the church. Formerly, the uh, church had 
the key to uh, um, life after death. And the idea being that life was pretty miserable and very short for people at the time. So the, uh, the belief that life after death would be good for them. And with time, too, though, things had been changing. Technology was uh, exchanging more and more ideas with people. And with the printing press, that uh, enabled even more to uh, occur of the exchange of ideas. Science was growing. Medical practice was growing. Artists were thriving because there was a need to um, make images of the world around people, the greater world around of people. And people wanted pictures of themselves, of their horses, their cows, their uh, homes. It was a, a kind of a prestige thing to have pictures of, of things, and artists thrive. But then another technology interrupted this uh, artistic movement of imagery, and it was photography. With photography, you could get an instant image, where before someone had to paint it. Um, and with photography, it was an easy thing to do. It was relatively easy. You could make many, product, uh, many copies of this. It seemed as if the artists were out of business and uh, art had failed. But um, artists are clever, and they just devised abstraction. That's the world that we were sort of born into. Um, where you don't necessarily have to make an image of something that exists because photography did it better, but you could use line and form and color and produce artistic works that had some meaning and that had some emotional value to people. And that's pretty much where we are now. That's where art is now. Um, and even in sculpture, uh, Alexander Calder added a new um, way of doing sculpture, which involved uh, movement in his uh, pieces of uh, sculpture. Technology started to take over in many ways. Uh, medical practice is actually works now, where in the beginning it uh, was not that great. Technology brought us uh, radio. When I was young, radio was the most marvelous thing in the world with Jack Armstrong and the All-American Boy and all that stuff. Then came television, which increased the visual uh, possibilities of the arts. And then we have uh, cell phones now, and uh, we have the internet. All of these things give us images of the world around us and increase the possibilities of our lives, they expand the horizon of our lives. And I suppose that's what art is all about. Everything, everything is art.